Can't nobody love you Like I'm loving you, baby Cause they don't know how To love you like I do Can't nobody love me Like I'm loving you, baby Cause they don't know how To love you like I do I'm gonna love you in the morning Love you late at night Girl, I ain't gonna stop loving you Till you tell me everything's all right Like I'm loving you right now Cause they don't know how To love you like I do And oh, oh, oh. Can't nobody kiss you Like I'm kissing you little girl Cause they don't know how To kiss you like I do And let me tell you Good morning, everybody. Please come on in and take a seat so we can kick off the keynote. Thank you. It's early in the morning, about a quarter till three. I'm sitting here talking with my baby over cigarettes and coffee. Cigarettes and 
drinking coffee that long And I'd like to show you where I've known nothing but good old joy Since I met you Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Americans for the Arts and our local hosts, Arts Memphis, welcome to the 2017 National Arts Marketing Project Conference. Please silence your cell phones as the program is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Stax Music Academy's Street Corner Harmonies. Music. Just as long as it's swinging, it's 
sounds Woo! like music. music. I got to get the feeling. Go. That real good feeling. Go. Just as long as it's swinging. Go. I got to get the feeling. Go. It sounds like music. music. That hey. sweet soul oh. music. music. Just as long hey. as it's swinging. Hey. Music. It sounds like music. music. I got to get the feeling. Go. Sitting in the morning sun, I'll be sitting when the evening comes, watching the ships roll in, and then I watch them roll away again. I'm just sitting on the dock of the bay, watching the tides roll away. I'm just Ha, wasting time. Come on. I love my home in Georgia. Headed for the Frisco Bay. See, I have nothing to live for. Seems like nothing's gonna come my way. Sitting on the dock of the bay. Listen, <laughs> it looks like nothing's gonna change. I can't do what 10 people tell me to do. I can't do it. No, I can't. Let me tell you, huh? So I guess I'll remain the same. I'm just sitting there in my and this loneliness. Miles I've walked Just to make Just to make This talk my home Sitting over the dock of the I'm watching the tides Away I'm the sea Sitting over the dock of the bay Wasting time Another big round of applause for the students from Saks Music Academy and Street Corner Harmonies. 
Good morning, and I'm Elizabeth Rouse, President and CEO of Arts Memphis, and we are so thrilled to welcome you here to Memphis for this marketing conference. This is a tough act to follow, but there is uh, no better way to introduce you to our great city. There is, in fact, no other place in the world where you will find such a unique tribute to a city's musical heritage coupled with the living, breathing manifestation of its legacy. Located just a few miles from here, the Stax Music Academy joins the Soulsville Charter School and the Stax Museum of American Soul Music to make up the incredibly transformative Soulsville campus, and I hope some of you will have the opportunity to visit there this week. The brilliant and hardworking team from Americans for the Arts, along with a fantastic local host committee, has planned a packed and exciting few days for you here. We've been talking with Americans for the Arts for years about bringing this conference to Memphis, and there is no better time than this. Our city is in the midst of a year-long commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at the Lorraine Motel, which is just down the street. And tonight, you will have the chance to visit one of the most important places in the civil rights movement at Claiborne Temple. And so we'd like to share this brief video about the venue tonight so for the opening reception so that you know the significance of the space. Claiborne Temple will always hold a very significant place in the history of Memphis and especially the civil rights movement. In 1968, when the sanitation workers were treated unfairly on their jobs, this was their meeting place. The union workers, the leaders, the ministers, the NAACP and all of the other people who rallied around the sanitation workers. I'm connected in spirit to the space because of the work my ancestors and elders did here. And I recognize the potential for this space being a hub for folks who don't look like each other or who have very different backgrounds to come together and uh, meet around music and meet around art. I have been tasked with helping to develop programming that will allow people opportunities to come together in the space, to have some conversations or exchanges that help to uh, shift the consciousness and develop relationships across lines that have been present for a very long time in this city. After the church was closed in 1999, we felt a void. I am just elated that it is going to be preserved, that it will continue to be a part of the historical sites in Memphis, and not only just a site in history, but it's a part of the history as we go forward for it to be sustainable and for it to show respect and honor for the building's history. Everything that takes place here must honor that in some way. I heard somebody say that artists and arts do the work that politicians can't do. It does help to tear down walls that we may not have the verbiage to address. That approach, that dangerous, dynamic, sometimes scary approach to like, to change and engagement has to be a part of literally everything that we do. And that's the only way that this thing can be sustained. Like it's way too important. So tonight really will be a unique opportunity to visit the space that has been recently reimagined and is an incredibly historic space. You'll have the chance to enjoy some culinary arts and visual arts and amazing music in Memphis. So we look forward to having you tonight. I'd like to now call up Lucy Lee, who is the board chair of Arts Memphis, just for a word of welcome um, from Arts Memphis and our board of directors. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good morning. I want to welcome all of you to Memphis. We are proud to be holding this conference for Americans for the Arts and to have all of you in our great city. You have come to the right place for a conference on the arts. 
and I'm going to brag a little. Of course, we're famous all over the world for Elvis. I went to Graceland last week myself. They completed a new renovation and exhibition space last March, and it is definitely worth a visit. Um, so I encourage you to go there if, they'll, if you have a chance. Legends like Elvis, B.B. King, and Otis Redding made their music here and recorded it at Stax Records. We are, however, about more than the blues and rock and roll, although we're very proud of that. Memphis is also immortalized in the photographs of William Eggleston, who revolutionized the art of photography with his color exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art in the 70s. The urban dance form known as Jukin was born here and taken to mainstream audiences by um, our new ballet company's Little Buck. I urge you, to watch him dance um, the swan in a performance with Yo-Yo Ma on the cello. It's on YouTube. Opera Memphis performs 30 Days of Opera in September. It's a festival of pop-up arts every day all over the city. If you have a chance, visit the Memphis Brooks Museum of Art in beautiful Overton Park. Brooks is the oldest and largest museum in the state of Tennessee. Currently, there is an excellent, excellent sculpture exhibit coming to America on view, as well as their strong permanent collection of paintings, sculpture, and decorative arts. There is also one of the world's largest coll collections of William Eggleston photographs. This afternoon, you will have the pleasure of seeing Ballet Memphis perform. Ballet Memphis holds the distinction of being the nation's most diverse professional dance company. The company has performed at the Kennedy Center and at the Joyce Theater in New York. They have just completed their stunning new headquarters in the center of the city at Overton Square. I hope you'll have a chance to go there. Overton Square is also the home to Playhouse on the Square and to the Hattie Lou Theater. Hattie Lou is one of the only independent African-American theater companies in the country. Last weekend, the Memphis Indie Film Festival was headquartered in Overton Square. It was, movies were shown there and in other venues all over the city. It drew filmmakers and fans from all over the country. Obviously, you can see that I have the right to brag on Memphis. Our arts community is thriving, and we at Arts Memphis are very proud. A recent study of the economic impact of the arts showed that this region's nonprofit arts sector supports the equivalent of more than 6,000 full-time jobs. This makes the arts sector the second largest employer in the region, just behind another great Memphis company, FedEx. And that is likely to expand as the city embarks on a major plan to redevelop the historic riverfront. In the course of this weekend, I know you'll get some great ideas and have new skills to take back to your own cities and communities, but I hope you'll take back something else the message that exciting things are happening in the arts in Memphis. What's more, I hope you'll have a wonderful time and come back and visit us often. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chairman Lee. Um, and I want to thank Elizabeth and Tracy and the whole team at Arts Memphis. Your work and the work of uh, all of the other folks here in Memphis who welcomed us in has been essential to creating this year's action-packed, information-packed, inspiration-packed, I hope, uh, NAMP conference. I'm Bob Lynch, 
President and CEO of Americans for the Arts, and I'm really happy to be welcoming you here to Memphis, myself, for the 2017 National Arts Marketing Conference. But before I go any further, I just want to say three words. Stax Music Academy. Unbelievable. I mean, we almost can stop right here. Sweet Soul Music, Otis Redding, James Brown. It doesn't get much better than that. And uh, just uh, as, as, uh, uh, as the chairman was talking, um, I want to point out a couple things, too. Lil Buck and uh, Yo-Yo Ma performed together uh, for our Nancy Hanks lecture in Washington, D.C. I think that was the first time they did that. Um, and you can see that uh, on our website if you Google any one of them, including um, the uh, music core from Walter Reed Hospital who performed that night uh, as well. And we had the honor three or four years ago to honor B.B. King at our National Arts Awards. So our ties to Memphis um, are strong. Um, I just want to say a couple words about Americans for the Arts. For decades, Americans for the Arts has been committed to supporting, training, and connecting uh, those of you who promote and advertise and market and communicate about arts and culture. In that time and still today, the percentage of um, arts organizations that they bring in from earned income, the part that most of you are responsible for, has shifted from some 40% a few years ago, less than that, to, to over 60% today. Um, that's for nonprofit arts organizations in America. Of course, for for-profit and for artists, it's 100%, almost 100%. And so this has reinforced our commitment to supporting your good work uh, in marketing. It's essential for the arts and the nonprofit arts particularly to survive in our country. So your good work is crucial to the arts sector. And for all the effort that you make, you deserve, I think, a big round of applause for yourself. So could we start off with you just applauding yourselves? Now, I want to talk to you just briefly about the state of the arts um, in our country and uh, our country itself, and also to celebrate your great role in communicating the value and the impact of what we, all of us, do in our communities every single day. But before I do that, I want to ask you to join me in thanking the generous funders of this year's National Arts Marketing Project Conference, without whom we could not gather you. AutoZone, the Belts Foundation, Patron Manager, the Wallace Foundation, the Tennessee Arts Commission, <clears throat> the Downtown Memphis Commission, the FedEx Corporation, uh, Martha Rivers Ingram uh, Advised Fund at the Community Foundation, and she's one of our Business Committee for the Arts board members, um, and that's the, commission, the Foundation of Middle Tennessee. TRG Arts, the Memphis Convention and Visitors Bureau, uh, and Buster's Liquors. So thank you to all of uh, those folks. You know, that's important because 30% of the funding for the arts, uh, the nonprofit arts in America, comes from the private sector and another 10% from the public sector, uh, hand in hand with the marketing that, uh, that you do. Um, in addition, I would like to celebrate the following premium members of Americans for the Arts, um, and also all of the more than 7,000 professional members um, who we support and who are part of our organization for being a, a crucial part of the Americans for the Arts family, and I will mention them because they're so important to us. ArtsWave, the City of Albuquerque, Cultural Services Department, City of Austin, Cultural Arts Division, City of Los Angeles, Cultural Affairs Department, City of Sacramento Cultural Services, City of Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, the Cultural Council of Palm Beach, yeah, whoop it out if you're here, um, <laughs> Cultural Council um, of Palm Beach, Little Kids Rock, um, Regional Arts and Culture Council in Portland, SF Jazz, uh, and also the Arts and Science Council of Charlotte Mecklenburg Incorporated, the Broward County Cultural Division, Fulton County Department of Arts and Culture, Irving Arts Center, Miami-Dade County Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, I want to thank all of those people for being such strong supporters of us. And one additional word I would like to thank, because I see them running around the office crazy this year, getting ready for all kinds of things, including this, the staff of Americans for the Arts. Thank you so much. So for 57 years, um, through stakeholders and with stakeholders like you, Americans for the Arts has been working to support arts and culture organizations and creative workers to not only do their work, 
but to do work that creates and supports a healthier, more vibrant, and more equitable community. And for as long as we've been doing that, and for as long as those artists have been creating that work, we all have relied on the communicators, you, the storytellers, you, to share the good word about the arts and about what we all do. You promote the arts, but more than that, you stand in the front lines of communicating the value and the impact of the arts, just as was talked about um, in the introduction um, you just heard. And in this moment in our country's history, boy, your work is more important than ever. Particularly at this moment, as we as a country are confronting a tremendous amount of division and trying to understand how we can feel so diametrically opposed to one another, at this time, the arts have an integral role to play in helping people find their common ground. We are in a moment where uh, people think that they have nothing in common, at least many of them do, uh, with other people, and that is not good. I want to highlight just two of the many, many projects that we are involved with that are important to me that I, I thought you would find important uh, because of your work in making projects like this uh, successful. Today uh, is Veterans Day. And it's celebrated today or yesterday or in Monday, different places. It should be celebrated every day. Um, but I want to honor <clears throat> all the veterans and all the active duty military and particularly the wounded returnees who serve <clears throat> our country. Applause, please. And so for the, for the last half dozen years, um, a significant part of our Americans, uh, arts, Americans for the Arts work has been for those constituents, those constituents not only nationally, but in every town across the country. Uh, it was my honor on Thursday to be at Walter Reed Medical Hospital and do the keynote kickoff for the Arts and Healing Military Arts Festival that they have there every year. Um, we have a program at Americans for the Arts called the National Initiative for Arts, Health, and the Military that gathers this kind of, of these kinds of stories and leaders at the national level so we can do more and then gets that out to uh, local leaders all across the country so that they can create opportunities and programs that connect with veterans and the military. And as part of that, we are working with the National Endowment for the Arts on a thing called the Creative Forces uh, program. The Creative Forces takes the great work that is happening with arts and healing and art therapy at Walter Reed Medical Hospital, the largest investment in art therapy in the world, and taking that out to 14 other sites across the nation. And so with that, uh, we see ourselves today with about 15% of our budget focused on veterans and, and the military. Um, and so these stories need to be told, and you are the storytellers. So I appreciate what you do, and I appreciate what you're going to do. Um, the second story that I just want to highlight is that uh, last year when I spoke with you, um, we had just had an election. And we didn't know what was going to happen. In January, we found out what was going to happen. Um, and that was that the concept of federal support for, for creativity, for culture, for support at the federal level was challenged. Um, challenged by the fact that the federal administration zeroed out all of the federal arts programs that are about distribution. Not necessarily the big institutions in Washington, but all of the things, like the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, zero, 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 zero termination. Um, that's about a billion dollars of investment in the arts. And we undertook, with you, with many of you in this room, <clears throat> a massive marketing effort, because that's what it is, marketing. Sometimes that's called advocacy, but it's the same thing. Targets, change, um, making a difference, getting people to come up with uh, something that you want them to do. And so we took that and we had three target markets. The administration of the United States and the president, the House of Representatives and the United States Senate. And we enlisted through you and with you uh, in this time 7,000 professional members of our organization, 1,000 opinion leaders like military leaders, uh, U.S. Army generals and admirals, like artists, like business leaders, um, 150 national organizational partners, 
uh, we an, were able to recruit 365,000 citizen activists, um, and uh, this is a separate organization called the Americans for the Arts Action Fund. Many of you are members. And we also have a political action committee in that organization that raised a couple of hundred thousand dollars for us to give out as donations to key decision makers in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. We had an in-person strategy. Uh, the in-person strategy was to pull together 2,000 advocates in March in Washington at our Nancy Hanks Lecture and Advocacy Day to send delegations on a biweekly basis um, uh, in person of mayors and county leaders and business leaders and arts leaders to the Capitol. That was our in-person strategy. We created fly-ins of local arts agencies to come in and meet directly with members of the Appropriations Committee of the House and the Senate, the people who are going to make the decisions. We uh, had a communication strategy in addition to that in-person strategy. Um, Full-page ads in national political media that the actual uh, congressional leaders read every day, Politico, The Hill, and Roll Call. Um, Full-page ads in appropriators' um, hometown newspapers. And, and uh, my multimedia show today is uh, simply this, uh, which is, um, this is the newspaper of Riverside, California. Anybody from Riverside, California, or California? And in that, in that county, in that town, lives a, a gentleman named Congressman Ken Calvert, the single most important congressman to the arts in America. Does anybody know that? No. He chairs the Appropriations Committee, but when he goes home and reads this paper, he sees this ad on a monthly basis. And I'm proud to say that in this time period, um, uh, Congressman uh, Ken Calvert has gone from a very low rating um, in our annual rating of congressional uh, support for the arts to an A rating. And so with that, um, full page ads uh, in all of the appropriators' decision making, uh, the decision making appropriators' hometown newspapers, um, opinion editorials from you in all of those communities, 421 credits in just one of the places that we, um, that we get the message out, National Public Radio, and then unexpected powerful voices, the next strategy, through mostly uh, social media, whether it's Yoko Ono or Kerry Washington tweeting or a video that we just did a few weeks ago with Ben Folds and Josh Groban and Cal Penn and the great Julie Andrews, um, and unexpected voices like Mike Huckabee writing an op-ed for us, um, or Karen Pence chairing the um, Arts and Healing Military Kickoff event, um, or Senator Lisa Murkowski from Alaska who chairs the Appropriations Committee in the Senate, all Republicans and all working for this. And so with that, <clears throat> your marketing worked. The House of Representatives two weeks ago voted to restore the money to all of those agencies. The Senate is actually going to be voting to increase the money to all of those things. So you and your marketing work. So we will have to go through it every year for the next four years. So your marketing skills, your communication skills, your inspiration is more important than ever and we need all the help we can get. Um, our communities and our country need to stand strong in our commonality, which doesn't mean that we have to agree with each other on everything, but civilizations heal when they grow, learn, and connect. And at Americans for the Arts, we believe, as you do, that the arts and culture are critical to that healing. The arts make more things possible, including the expansion of empathy, the strengthening of community bonds and civic pride, the institution of an open and inclusive sense uh, of belonging, the nurturing of critical thinking, innovation, and the ability to imagine new pathways, uh, pathways forward in these difficult times, and the transformation of systems toward more equitable and powerful outcomes for all. And literally, none of that amazing, crucial transformation can happen in those communities uh, if those communities don't know that the arts and culture are there. Uh, that, they, that they don't value, uh, if they don't value what creative workers are bringing to the table, or that they don't understand the impact that the arts have in their lives, which of course is where you come in. Every day, for many reasons, your work becomes more complicated, and we're at a, a moment when the relationship between communities and their culture um, is shifting uh, and changing the boundaries of the community to be served and the culture to be supported um, broader 
uh, than currently at play in most arts programming. So communities demand and expect new, transformed ways uh, of engagement and a natural and constant underpinning of equitable policies and practices that can sometimes be challenging to live up to for even the most forward-thinking institutions. The visibility and value of the arts increases when they are tied to parts of community and parts of individual life that are visible and valued, whether it's the healing part or the military part or the economic part. Um, and that makes partnership and humility in our partnership crucial. And if our fate is tied up in how much people value what we do, then we need to place more of a premium on the communication of that value, what you do and what we say and our dependence on all the people in this room. So thank you. Thank you for the work that you do every day to stretch the boundaries of arts and culture, to connect disparate communities, to promote that empathy and critical thinking, to pursue equity. Your work is crucial work, and we at Americans for the Arts are really proud to support it, especially this year, in this time, in a place like Memphis, where the undercurrents of civil rights, soul music, as you heard, southern cooking, community and hope converge and remind us of exactly, exactly how powerful the arts can be. As some of you may have heard, when I was in high school, I studied ancient Greek and poetry. Uh, I went to a Catholic Jesuit high school. Uh, I took it for a day and a half. <laughs> but like all good arts administrators, I came out of it with a good quote, the oath of the Athenian citizen. Um, which I think uh, of as I look out at, at all of you. And that quote is this, we commit this city to be not as good as, but better than, not as beautiful as, but more beautiful than when it was committed to us. That's you. This is what the arts do, and this is what you're doing. So thank you for celebrating and sharing the power of the arts to help transform communities <clears throat> and for all that you do to ensure a full creative life for everyone. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to have one more job, and uh, it is the job of introducing our opening keynote. Um, the keynote uh, by a wonderful duo, the powerhouse team um, of Luba Tulkachev and Rodrigo, Ala I'm sorry, Rodrigo Alanis. Um, Luba and Rodrigo are two of the most exciting visionaries that we found working in cultural marketing today. She is co-founder and COO, and he is global strategist for Gravity, an award-winning cultural advertising agency that also happens to be the fastest growing in the United States. Gravity specializes in building relevancy in this interconnected world. They call themselves cultural transplants and digital natives. Fluent, this makes my Greek pathetic, fluent in 20 languages, boardroom jargon, marketing buzzwords, and code. Gravity is a firm whose expertise is as deeply, um, is, is as deeply integrating uh, as the, um, the work uh, that they do with the 9-11 Memorial Affinity um, Health. Uh, I'm sorry, the 9-11 Memorial Affinity Health, Caesars Entertainment, Captain Morgan, Comcast, the US Army, and Western Union. And you can find Luba and Rodrigo's full bios and the conference um, app instructions for downloading the app are in your printed program. So I'm going to leave it there for now. Uh, please welcome our 2017 opening keynote, Luba and Rodrigo. Thank you so much. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Is the mic on? Awesome. So just for the record, we don't speak 20 languages. Our team, Our team collectively does. speaks 20 languages. <laughs> <laughs> I but wish we, I did. I'm sure Rod does as well. We do both um, speak more than one. We do, uh, we do speak more than one. And that's actually one of the requirements for us at the agency. As we were building a cultural agency, we wanted to make sure that we hire really, really smart marketers. Uh, but they must be of diverse backgrounds. So they must speak multiple languages. They must live in different parts of the, have lived in different parts of the world and really bring a very strong POV to the table to talk about culture. So what I think we'll do, because we did prepare a presentation, the presentation will show on those two sides and for me here. 
Uh, we will walk you through the presentation because it helps guide the conversation, but as you will notice, Rod and I both like to tell stories. Um, I will first tell the story of Gravity and how the agency came about, and Rod will then walk you through some of the amazing work that not only Gravity is doing, but also that we're seeing in the external environment. And that's gonna be a really nice narrative for us to go into Q&A, because really, culture, and that's the word that we're all hearing, Culture is not only critical in one specific industry, culture is critical across all, and we're here to talk about how advertising, arts, and culture come together. And if I know how to... Oh, this one. Yes. <laughs> Feels like it's a little cut off. But um, regardless, our motto at Gravity uh, is that culture is everything. Uh, culture is the reason why we created the agency. The agency was created 10 years ago, and back then culture was defined a little bit differently than what we define in, in advertising today. We were working with the telecoms, the airlines, and so forth, that saw that their customers were of if, uh, different ethnic backgrounds. Ethnic backgrounds and spoke different languages, so they wanted to figure out strategies to be able to get them to buy more airline tickets to go back home, to buy more you know, or phone services to call back home, and so forth. But that has certainly evolved. It's in the last two to three years that we are invited to the boardroom, sitting with the CMOs and so forth, that we are no longer having a conversation about why you should do multicultural marketing, which is what cultural marketing is referred to traditionally. We are now talking about how and what is the most effective way of doing so. Because now we know it's critical, and I'll show you the statistics. Now it's a matter of how do I properly connect with my audience, right? And um, the way that it was done even five years ago is just not okay anymore. So uh, we integrate brands into cultures. This is the offering that we offer our clients. And as Bob mentioned, we do work across many different industries. I think it is, since it is Veterans Day, it's really important to note that we do work with the US Army. The US Army is dedicated and committed to making sure that they have a very diverse force. And we are the agency that helps them figure out what are the right ways to communicate with various ethnic corridors and multicultural corridors in the United States. And they do really amazing work. This, this gets good. So um, <laughs> our slides are not coming up. Our, our images are not coming up. But we'll just keep going. So uh, the United States is the most diverse, I say it's the most diverse country in the world, right? I put one of, because I don't want to argue, there's some people who believe there's other countries who are more diverse, uh, but we have more than 120 million people in the United States that identify themselves as multicultural, of different ethnicities. That's almost 40% of our population, right? And it's not only because, it's important because people are from different backgrounds, languages, and so forth. We just have such a diverse population, and people think differently, do differently, they act differently, and that is something, as marketers, we should all really pay attention to. I actually meant to ask a question before I got on. How many, I know everyone here is, you know, is a marketer and, and works in this space. How many have actually practiced a form of multicultural marketing in their field? Oh, that's amazing. That's way more than I'll ever get in like a, uh, I don't know, financial conference. <laughs> um, because that was about, I think about 20 to 30% of the room. So uh, it is not only about ethnicity, it is just about the fact that we as a nation have extremely diverse POV, a point of view on the world. And as marketers, it is critical for us as we create these spaces where culture comes together that we recognize that and figure out what is the best way forward. Oh, there's a picture. It came up. And you say. <laughs> They're really good pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought it was actually really Excuse interesting. Me, when we it. first got the call to, uh, to come and have this conversation, um, we at Gravity pride ourselves on being you know, the number one cultural agency in the United States. We do all this amazing work. We focus on subcultures and all these different things that are happening. And then we get a call from, from you guys that, you know, come talk to us about culture. And the big question for me was, well, that is really ironic because I rely or we rely on artists to help us understand where the culture is coming from. And we rely to make sure that we're paying attention to the various trends that are happening on the fringes that ultimately will come back to the core. And as we were preparing, uh, as we were having that conversation, we were actually working on a really interesting project called CMYK. And uh, it's a collaboration between photographers in the United States that were documenting subcultures in the United States. 
And we worked with them to make sure that we are getting a greater understanding not only for ourselves, but also for our clients. And this one in specific is uh, by Bobby Rogers, and he explores what it means to be black in America. And his position is that it is not monolithic, as many believe, and he goes into a exploration about what it means to be uh, black and Muslim, and um, a couple of other uh, narratives, and we'll definitely share that as a follow-up. But the point here is not necessarily about the work. The point is we as marketers have a long-standing history of relying on the arts to inspire us and connect with consumers, so it is a real honor to be here. Bobby spoke a lot about this year, right? So talking about this year and why we're doing the things that we're doing, because the spaces that we're now creating as uh, marketers, as uh, those in the arts community, are really critical in pe people, putting people together. Um, we at Gravity asked the question of why is it that we do what we do, right? We've been doing this for 10 years, we started because there was a need for language, and now we wanted to say, like, in this political environment, when everything is being pulled apart, right, unity is not something that we're talking about coll um, collectively, we wanted to identify why we, as Gravity, are doing and, you know, working on what we're working on. And the why for us, and it's really critical to think about the why, is because we, as a collective, believe that culture is at the heart of human progress. It matters now more than ever. And since the media and you know, politicians and everything around us is kind of, it seems like everything is pulling to divide us, we thought it was really critical as the voices that do have a conversation with some of the biggest brands in the world to have this honest dialogue and figure out how we could bring people together through arts, through marketing, through everything else that we could actually physically or impact as a company. Um, how? So we do that through the people that we hire, and I think you know, it was alluded to the fact that uh, we do have a very multicultural and diverse workforce. We feel like the United Nations every time we come to work, and it's really amazing. Uh, it's, it's really cool, because you'll come into the lunchroom and you have people from Korea and Afghanistan and all these amazing places uh, having lunch together, and you cannot not like people when you see them up close, right, and have a relationship with them. And that is the mission that us as, as Gravity have to the external world. And uh, what we do, we integrate brands into cultures. I think that's enough about us. Um, again, culture is everything. And this is the beautiful America. Oh, it's not going automatically either. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we live in a really amazing place, right? People have different backgrounds, different opinions, they tell different stories, they inspire us in so many different ways, yet inequality still prevails. This is something that we hoped as marketers, communicators, as the human race, I think, when technology really came on the rise, we thought that that was going to be a platform to equalize things, right? People will have access to more data, more information, they would really be able to have similar opportunities. But what we've seen in the last five years is that it's actually been the total opposite, and inequality still prevails. And this is not inequality necessarily about race. It's about income, it's about race, it's about you know, Main Street versus Wall Street, it's all these things, that's all you kind of hear in the press and around you. And when I thought about you know, the people that I'm speaking with, and you know this, I just thought it was really important to put it on the slide and actually have a conversation about this, is you, as the leaders in the art space, you have the complete power to create environments that will bring people together. You have the space, you have the inspiration, you have the resources, hopefully, uh, to bring people into an environment for the ability to move thought forward, right? To, uh, art has the responsibility to evolve the human race, and the responsibility is is ours. So for this point and, and you know, for this conversation, I think it's just really critical to note that we do have a lot of power about and to change about the things that are happening externally, and it's something that we should be very mindful of and treat with a lot of responsibility. Before I hand it over to Rod to tell the stories of some of the work that uh, we do and is, uh, inspires us, it's really critical that we go through the statistics just so you guys know and that we're all on the same page. So multicultural consumers are the fastest growing segment in the US population. So every year we add 2.3 million multicultural consumers into our ecosystem, right? And that's both by immigration and by uh, birth. So that 263 people who identify as non-white are born every hour or uh, are here every hour. This slide has rocked our marketing world. And we have this conversation all the time. In the, um, 
If you look at the chart, basically what it shows you, only a dozen, does it, can you see? All right. Um, everyone under the age of nine years old, so imagine all the, the future, right, the youth of our nation, the youngest population in the United States. More than 50% of that population is already multicultural. They're non-white. So when we talk about the minority becoming the majority, majority, it's here. It's just in our younger demographic. And what else is happening with our younger demographic? They don't remember a world where there was no social media and internet and so forth. They don't remember a world, world where top-down was the way that they received their information. They know a world where they're creators and they have the power in their hands. So this, a slide like this or statistics like this are so critical for anyone who is really looking for their future consumer. This is the future consumer. Now the challenge is how do you actually relate to them? So 14.9% are foreign born or will be foreign born by 2025. And the last time this happened was in 1890, that we had such a high percentage of people who were foreign born in the United States. And what happened around that time was, oh, let's go back, um, the Industrial Revolution. Right? And think about all the innovation and all the thought and all the inventions and all the things that we were able to achieve at that time. And the fact that we are, again, going to be in a place where we have so many people from different parts of the world coming together is something really exciting for us as marketers and as people. So kind of saying the same thing that by 2060, collectively, because those who are young now will rise through, through their ages and uh, there will be more immigration trends and um, the minority will be the majority by 2060. But actually, this exists today, right? So if you look at the major DMAs uh, in the United States, we just outlined a couple of them. Miami, it's almost 70% multicultural, right? If you go to Miami, <laughs> you, it's, you know, it, it, the, Second language is Spanish, and you, if you want to do business and live there and be happy and enjoy, you really have to understand that and be part of that communication and, and that community, and especially as a marketer. Uh, Houston, 67%. Los Angeles, 65%. San Antonio, 63%. San Francisco, 61%. So the future, what's going to happen in 2060, is actually here. It's just not covering the entirety of the United States. And New York is 51% multicultural. So uh, Queens, a borough in New York, actually has over 100 languages spoken in a very, very small space. We all know how small New York City is. Uh, it is the most diverse neighborhood or, or borough in the world. And there are many companies that want to communicate with and sell to and have relationships with, with these consumers, and that is, in essence, the, the work that we do. Uh, one of the things that I know when I started doing research about the arts collectively, um, there was a big push to... Um, you know, put arts out in communities that are underprivileged. The one point I wanted to make sure that I make is that uh, the multicultural consumer has enormous buying power, and it continues to rise. So by 2014, the uh, buying power jumped up by over 400% from the 1990s to 3.4 trillion. If you, if you remember the 1990s, multicultural in 1990s was completely different. You had a lot of immigrants coming to the United States in the 70s and 80s that were fleeing war-torn countries. This is no longer the case. The, this is just a little bit more about buying power. Oh, don't close your eyes yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I wanted to say is that the immigrants or the multicultural consumer that is now in the United States has disposable income. They have higher education. They have dreams and passions, and they want to be able to uh, have communities that are able to nurture the progress that's happening. And what I'm going to do is hand this over to Rod so he could continue the conversations in ways that make it more tangible and seeing the stories that we have previously been part of. All right, so before we go into, I think you had an overview of the data, um, but what's really important is putting a human face on the data, right? So take a moment right now. I want to take a, we're not going to put you to sleep, maybe a little bit of a nap, but close your eyes for a second with me. Everyone close your eyes, and I can tell if you're not closing your eyes, and I will pick on you. Uh, so close your eyes. So picture in your mind and in your head right now the typical American, right? Typical American. So think of criteria that comes to mind, age, right? Hair color, eye color, right? Gender. Start thinking of all these elements that play into what you imagine in your mind to be the typical American. Now put them in the context of your typical customer, right? Now more and more what we're seeing is that that vision that all of you may have in your head 
is more and more it is difficult to reach a consensus, right? An image that coincides with all of us when we say that kind of a question of what they visualize. So if you open your eyes, I'll take you through what uh, an interesting artist of uh, Martin Scholler, and I don't know if anyone has seen this work that was done on the 125th anniversary of the National Geographic. And he did a really interesting expose, right? He said, you know, until you put a human face and an image on the data and on the numbers, people have a hard time relating to it, making sense of it all. But this is his kind of uh, prognostication, if you will, his kind of look into the future of what the future of America will look like, right? Now, it's based upon a combination of what we say with culture. Culture is less assimilative and more participatory than it's ever been. This is a reflection of the changing face of what America will look like. So it really begs, here, the, the, the cool thing about this is when you start to break down your stereotypical perceptions of how you might see people and typical Americans, it starts to challenge your point of view, your presumptions, right? Your predispositions towards how those people think, feel, act, et cetera. And that's where we need to move the conversation in order to really start to understand how do we connect with them differently. When you look at the face of America as a whole, like I think there's, there's, this is a really, really exemplary uh, photo, right? This moment here, the Fabulous Five the most diverse group of young women to win the accolade that they won, which was actually, they won by the highest margin since 2006, right? Uh, but the most diverse group ever in the history of the US Olympic gymnastics team, right? So a really incredible accomplishment, but also really, really, again, reflective of where the country is going and how the shifts are happening. If you look then the flip side of where we stand now, you talk about the world of sport, right? Being a great unifier. Well, we know, of course, the whole situation that's happening now, of course, where politics has crossed over into the space of sport what that means, the dialogue it's bringing to the forefront. And it is a dialogue that transcends just ethnicity and race. It's a dialogue that goes into a much deeper conversation about the state that we find ourselves in now as society. So what has triggered all the changes in the conversations? You know, one of the things that I find fascinating with museums is I had gone to the International Center of Photography in New York, and we were engaged in discussion here, and it's hard to see the image in the background, but what you have here is a discussion around the taking down of statues, right? Art commodities that really in society have reflected history and culture. Uh, and really taking down the Confederate statues that represented leaders of the past, so to speak, but really, what is their relevance today in the dialogue and the narrative that we have today in the societies we live in? And what do they say about the society that we are part of and where we are going? So the other question that, of course, museums can step into and have a dialogue with is, what do you do when you take these statues down, right? Huge referendum right now, just de Blasio in New York also said, you know what, let's take a look at all the statues in New York and see which ones we need to take down and replace. So where do you put the statues to get moved? And then what happens in the space that's now evacuated, right? There are other countries of the world, Germany, I think of, when they went through a massive transition, of course, right? Uh, really understanding what do they do and the implications that has for society and how we think and view ourselves and interact with one another. The stories and narratives is built around that. JR, this French artist, I don't know who's familiar with this image. Have you seen it here? Tecate Mexico, see? Uh, for my Latinos. See? Uh, here, what we see is an image of a young child peering over the, the fence, right, the wall. And this was really interesting, right? It coincided, actually, with the time there was discussion around the DACA, right, the Dreamers Act, and all the situation happened around immigration reform, and he wanted to pose that commentary as a child, and you're peering over this wall, almost like he could teeter over, right? He gets a little excited, and he pushes the wall over, not knowing why do we keep these boundaries of separation between each other, and how prevalent they still are in society. Um, again, coinciding with DACA, the Dreamers Act, again, issues in society as a whole, just painting a backdrop. So when you see the data, you hear the numbers, and then you start to talk, okay, how is it really impacting the way we live our lives daily? So DACA and the Dreamers Act, of course, we know what's happened there with immigration reform and also the implication it's had in driving that dialogue. There is no question society as a whole, as we mentioned earlier, is shifting. This Wednesday, uh, November 8th, right? Really fascinating, the shifts in the elections, right? Again, yeah, absolutely. So here you have you know, two transgender, obviously openly transgender women who have assumed and won races, right? Taken races, fantastic. On the right side here, what we have here is the first seat mayor elected in New Jersey and the first black woman to be elected mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina, right? So some really interesting changes that are afoot. Now again, these changes aren't just, you know, obviously blips on the radar screen, right? They are trends that are signaling, again, the data that we saw earlier, the shifts that are happening in reality, and what that means for creating opportunities in the world we communicate in. And Bob mentioned this earlier, that culture is indeed, as a whole, shifting. We tend to look at a lot of the data, right? So we are also an agency that deals a lot in the media space. And because of the proliferation of data, we're constantly quantifying and saying, okay, what are Google searches going? Where are trends reports going? What's real-time listening telling us? And the reality is the conversation has absolutely shifted, right? So it's not something that's just happening by virtue of the numbers in the shift. 
it is a mind shift that's happening as well, right? The things we're talking about, the things that we're really discussing and engaging in, and it presents really interesting opportunities for marketers and for us as a whole collectively, creators in the space. The, the old paradigm when you try to make, shift, you make sense of this all was that everyone wanted to assimilate. And there was a point in time in America where American culture was all about assimilating and acculturating. And a lot of the models that we have today as marketers are built on stage of assimilation and acculturation in society. What we've come to realize is that culture today has really shifted in a big way. We're moving from the fringes to the cores. As these groups obviously grow in number, but also in pride of ethnic heritage, association with background and a sense of identity. And what it's created is a very different world. Not saying that I don't want to be as American anymore. It's the concept and idea of what American is that is changing. Right? As these groups grow now, it is about culture participating with one another as opposed to assimilating. So it really invites us to revisit the way we think about assimilation and acculturation, right? Now you have families, you have groups, you have people, societies, et cetera, that we are participating. We're all mingled and mixed with one another. Martin Shoulder in his portrait earlier showed us that, right? This is the changing face and reality of the world that we live in, and you can't deny the fact of where it's going. So we say culture is less about assimilation and acculturation and more about participation. Less assimilative and more participatory than it has ever been. So you see it reflected now in music, in art, in fashion, in food, in all these places. Everyone knows this? Who is this here? Despacito. I was going to play the music, but I thought my Latino colleagues in here would probably stand up and dance, and I couldn't get them to sit down. So I said, no, no music. Uh, Despacito, right? Daddy Yankee, uh, uh, Jose, uh, Luis, uh, uh, Franci, uh, Fonsi, Luis Fonsi and Daddy Yankee here. Also, Justin Bieber joined later, right? Now, here's an interesting story. Justin Bieber, when he heard the music and he heard this, he said, oh, I want to become a part of this. I find this music fascinating. It's fantastic. I love the beat. Then he had a concert recently in Sweden. Okay, Sweden, right? He's in Sweden, and they asked him. The crowd was asking. The fans were saying, hey, sing Despacito, Despacito. Well, he doesn't know all the words. So <laughs> that's a problem. So he doesn't know all the words. So he gets booed off stage. They actually threw things at him and booed him off the stage. So again, what's really fascinating about this trend, yes, you've had blips on the screen before with Latino music and other sources of music coming into the forefront. What's interesting here is the trajectory it took, a gradual transition, and then stayed at the top and how long it stayed there. And then what you see as a result of that, everyone embracing the music for the way it makes you feel, irrespective of language and differences of sound, and it's not my cultural, ethnic relationship, I don't have it with that music. All that is going aside, right? We are really stepping into a world, again, where culture is more participatory and less assimilative. Anyone know this gentleman here? No? Sam Hunt, any country music lovers? Okay, so this is interesting. Country music, Sam Hunt, right? Sam Hunt was told when he started out in country music because he's a lover of, you know, Alan Jackson and Travis Tripp. But on the other hand, inspired by R&B, on the R&B side, he really liked Juvenile and Bone Thugs and Harmony. So his mentors in the music space, in the country space, said, hey, you'll never win. You'll never succeed there. You won't build a following or a good fan base. He's proved them wrong because now, five number one hits later and a Grammy debuted, a Grammy nominated debut album He's actually proving them wrong. And he's having the conversations about music and art and how all these things play a critical and vital role in bringing us together and how new generations coming to the pipeline, again, are more participating and in leading into music irrespective of the people that we've traditionally associated with certain kinds of music. Everyone knows this gentleman, right? No. Action Bronson. Action Bronson is really interesting. Albanian Muslim heritage, lives in Queens, New York. Uh, recently, so he has a cooking program on Rachel Ray. He does hip hop music inspired by Wu-Tang Clan largely. Um, so he has hip hop and music label. He just did a partnership deal with Vice, does a Snapchat program on behalf of, of Match.com where he does a dating show on Snapchat, right? So think about all this going on there. Albanian Muslim, you know, Wu-Tang Clan, you got the music, the, the participation across so many media formats and also such a varied background, right? Someone who you might say, oh, outlier on the fringes, doesn't belong in the mainstream. Again, we're changing fringes to the mainstream. So if you're looking for inspiration around the world where we find it, again, lean into those cultures on the fringes because what is fringe will become mainstream. That's where cool comes from, right? Uh, this is an interesting, so again, we have a colleague who's working with a young lady named Maria and she does a deconstruction of fast fashion and then reconstructs it in couture wear inspired by traditional African culture uh, and has really taken it uh, as a means by which to make great societal commentary on sustainability, on inequality, on just our preconceived notions of who designers and creators are in the space and how we lean into co-creation. And this is her. She's from Siberia. She's Russian. Uh, has spent time in Africa really appreciating and falling in love with the culture and understanding, again, trying to break down those walls and those barriers that exist that we have in preconceived notions that hold us back from stepping to different worlds in terms of how we communicate and market. 
So in our world, we say, you know, the industry keeps on telling us it's about multicultural marketing. It's not. It's about learning to market in a multicultural world, which we all inevitably will have to embrace and figure out how to do more effectively. You yourselves have the benefit of having been done it or have lived in a world where I think it's been much more prevalent than in the corporate side of things as we talk about it. You look at media and movies, the things that kind of influence and inspire so many of us. Marvel Comics. Anyone know when comic books, by the way, first came into being and why they became so popular? Any guesses? Big chaotic event. Yes, the war. The big world. Yes, exactly. And because we needed heroes. We needed a sense of certainty. We needed a sense of salvation, so to speak, right? Someone's going to guide us through the darkness. Second time it happened, anyone know when the second advent, this big push and momentum of movies in Marvel and DC happened? Was it? Uh, a little bit later. Someone said something else, so someone said civil rights. Any other guesses? 9-11. 9-11. The next big moment, right, which terrified us and said, oh, wow, we live in a big, scary world now. Again, uh, uh, an advent of storytelling that surrounded this idea of inspiration and the need to find certainty in heroes. Interesting thing is, you look at the kinds of movies that are coming out, and you see movies like this. Right? So Wonder Woman, didn't mention, but also incredibly successful. Uh, Black Panther, I brought up in the context, again, as we're talking about the culture, the setting and the backdrop of the, of the movie here, right, is about African culture, so to speak, right? It is not a storyline that evolves and takes place in the US, in that perspective, in how you traditionally have talked about superheroes. We're really starting to, again, understand and embrace and say, hey, look, this is a different ball game now. The storylines and narratives, the dialogue we need to have, have really need to come forward. And it presents really interesting opportunities for marketers. This, for those who love Bollywood, anyone? So India Z, largest producer of Bollywood content in India, just launched uh, Zemundo because they understand that Latinos have an affinity and love Bollywood because of the music, because of the drama. We love our drama. Uh, because of the excitement of the characters and the energy and the family-friendly, multi-generational appeal. Right? So they've launched a channel for Bollywood content, subtitled, and also translated into Spanish to appeal to a Latino community. So the crossover's happening, and this is the latest movie under the works, right? Disney, right? So this is interesting, Coco, right? So we know that a while back, Disney's, some of Disney's lawyers got a little bit ambitious and tried to uh, trademark um, Dia de los Muertos, right? <laughs> yeah, not a smart idea. <laughs> so, interestingly enough, so they said, oh, you know, we gotta hold back, we gotta rethink this model because this isn't working anymore. So they rethought, and now they're coming out with Coco. So this movie, however, they've released first in Mexico. So it's already released, and it actually is doing really, really, really well. Uh, I invite you to take a look at the trailer. It's, it's a really fascinating story. Again, it is a deeply cultural uh, component. For those that are familiar with Dida los Muertos and the role that it plays in Latino culture, it is a very deeply meaningful, personal, religious, uh, th there is a whole history and context that's rich and beautiful and becomes a very critical and important part of Latino culture. Nothing to do with Halloween, right? Uh, so this movie does a really impressive job of trying to really bridge that gap, that, that misunderstanding, and also acknowledges that, again, it's here, these changes. My prediction is this is a little dog in the movie, right? His name is Sholo. So he's a Sholo is a type of dog. Um, now, in, in the world of Vida de los Muertos and the Day of the Dead and the traditions, he actually guided people across the river into the afterlife, right? So that's the role that he plays. So my prediction is that, you know, this, this puppy here is going to be the best-selling dog after this movie comes out. <laughs> Everyone's going to want to want these. I'm going to come start selling these. But the point being, again, we start to see this crossover, how culture starts to interplay. Look into the fringes, embrace that, and see how we can stimulate dialogue around it. Uh, the media landscape is likewise involved, uh, evolving and changing. We've gone from cast inclusion to then being character-led to now having content and creation happening by, uh, again, multicultural groups. And I, and I say this in the context of a much broader word than just ethnicity, right? So the crossover that's happening, uh, the opportunities it presents, to partner with different media outlets to create opportunity is great and phenomenal. Um, this is a company called Gleam Futures. One of the things that's happening in the media landscape as we see this transition and fragmentation, it's going from top-down persuasion, traditional model, right, TV and big narratives, voice, you know, from the top down, to bottom-up influence, right? And in the bottom-up influence models, of course, and you guys have an advantage of having worked with artists and others where I think you have a better grasp on what that entails, uh, but in the bottom of influence, you have more of that diversity representation, right? That is the fastest growing demo, as we know, in terms of the numbers. But it also presents really interesting opportunities on how we start to see the evolution of that space and what it means. Now, it does mean we have more creation of content than ever before. So every two days, we create as much information as we did from the dawn of civilization up until 2003. Yeah, right? That's more information than the way I'm talking right now. <laughs> That's a lot of data. Point being that in this world, right, we are so inundated. We talk about engineered addiction. Mobile devices, the first thing we all probably check when we wake up in the morning, last thing we check before we go to bed at night. 
but what it does to kind of rewire our brains when you have that much information, and everywhere you turn to is right there in the palm of your hand. And the impact that has on institutions like museums and galleries and experiences as a whole. So human attention span, everyone seen these numbers? I hope you have, right? 12 seconds in 2000, right? Now this is, coincides actually with the advent of the Nokia, the mobile phone. Again, if you go back to 2000, that mobile phone came up and all of a sudden we're like, oh wow, like, you know, like moth to the flame. And we stick to it and our attention spans, our brains start getting rewired in terms of how we think. So any, everyone know the number here? Three, nine, yeah, that's very good, very close. Eight seconds. And your friend the goldfish has a nine second attention span, right? So <laughs> that's the idea, right? We're getting to it now. Here, here's an interesting thought when you take it beyond that in social. How about the average mobile Facebook user? Oh, the ad's gone. That's exactly how long your attention span lasts. <laughs> no, I'm serious, you laugh, but it's true. You wanna guess how long that was? Uh, how long would you say? Average attention span of the mobile Facebook user? 1.4 seconds. 1.4 seconds, right? Now these are the devices that now we're actively using in social media to really understand how we better connect with our audiences and our customers and drive them into actual physical uh, activities or experiences, right? In the next couple of decades, connected devices are introduced. Advertising will progress more than it has in the past 50 years, right? There, there is the always connected consumer, you're never offline. Um, there is both a pro and a con. It is an evolution and change in society, which is, I think, bridging a lot of gaps, breaking down a lot of barriers. On the flip side, it is really rewiring the brain and, I think, forcing us all to think, okay, how do we tap into this world? Uh, and it's interesting, right? 23% of Americans, when you look at the museum landscape, find art that appeals to them on social media, such as Instagram or Pinterest. This is an artist, actually, from a small town in uh, Maurice, I uh, Iowa. And the artist actually took his, uh, you know, his uh, Instagram feed and actually made a physical display out of it. Again, commentary on flipping the model around and kind of where society stands right now. And it's an interesting space, right? 20% discover art by going to museums, right? 23%, so we've seen the flip now, how they discover. But this is discovery of art. It's not to say it's just, yeah, the model's shifting. That's to say it's going away. It's just we have to rethink retail. Retail's going through what we call reverse retail, right? So it used to be the consumer still discovers a lot of products on their phone, whatever. Then they're coming into the retail experience. They're experiencing the product, but they're not buying it. They're then going back to the phone and buying it online, having it delivered via Amazon. Right? So retailers are thinking, okay, how do we create a retail experience that deepens the engagement with the consumer, tells more stories, really changes the way we take about retail and the footprint that retail has. A lot can be learned from what retail is going through in reverse retail that applies to museums and to the art space and vice versa. So there's a lot of possibility and potential, I think, for collaborations there. Um, not a surprise, I think we've all heard this conversation, right? Experiences trump things. In a world where we used to wear and kind of social status came with the brands and the logos we wore on our clothes, now, because we have social media, we're addicted to it, 1.4 second attention spans, we can now broadcast our experiences. So our experiences become our means of social status and communicating who we are and sense of identity. Everyone knows this group, right? Again, I was gonna play the music, but I thought you guys wouldn't sit down. Know the audience, rule number one. <laughs> the experience economy we talk about, as we favor experiences over material things, we talk about the experience economy. From 81 to 2012, the price of the average concert ticket rose over 400%. 400%. Right? You think, oh, we're, we're all going digital, people are gonna step away from experiences and they're not gonna pay more for tickets. Uh, that's, that's not true. And so what we are changing is obviously the way people think about experiences, their expectations. And so it invites us when we have spaces to showcase art or products that we're selling. How do we rethink the experience so it has more meaning and story to the consumer that comes in and experiences? So Abba's doing the museum. And we'll talk about now some of the trends that are happening in the space as a result of some of these changes in the larger landscape in terms of how we're thinking and feeling and interacting with each other. Immersive experiences, right? Uh, and this is in the brand space, so the world that we're kind of working in, and immersive experiences, again, creating experiences that really surround you and immerse you in all your senses to develop a deeper relationship and also a significance of meaning, so you remember what the hell you just saw, and hopefully uh, make a decision and a choice, and it simulates thinking. So Cadillac is a client, so we work with General Motors, and I work with Cadillac House, and we're really rethinking, Cadillac House again has made, anyone drive a Cadillac by the way? You better raise your hand. <laughs> and you get a Cadillac, no, I'm joking, I can't do that. <laughs> I'll talk to them though. Uh, but General Motors, uh, interesting, right? Took Cadillac and said, hey, you know, Cadillac, iconic brand, luxury car. Then it went through a massive change and an interesting story in terms of the relationship that Cadillac has within culture, right? Not always positive, some of it great. Point being, now they're trying to move forward and appeal to another, to again, a more multicultural generation, right? And the changes and the shifts are happening leaning into that. So they said, wow, to do that, we gotta really change our culture and the way we think and the way we operate. It's not just about changing the car, right? So pull out the headquarters. They relocated the headquarters, opened Cadillac House down in Soho in New York, away from Detroit, 
where the rest of the culture of the companies were with Chevy and Buick and um, pulled it out, relocated to New York, um, opened up Cadillac House. Cadillac House now is an interesting institution in the sense that, yes, it showcases a car, but you see a direct integration with art. So you have Visionaire that curates artists that do installations inside of Cadillac House because they want to position the brand in the car, again, creating an experience. It's not like you're walking into a dealership and seeing the car you want and then picking it out and buying. They're now shifting that whole dynamic and exploring a different way to get people to think differently about the car. So it plays a role in your lifestyle. We also see the change you know, from what it looks like to what it feels like, right? So again, changing those experiences. And as we do so, deepening, they're like, why is this funny? <laughs> you, you know you're true. You look at this and you're like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> I love my brand more than my spouse. This is interesting, right? So this is a study that was done in 2014 by a, a neuroeconomist, Paul Zak. And he really talks about, okay, what are the implications of a world in which we create these immersive experiences and start to shift about how they make people feel. You see art and how people are integrating, you know, their experiences around artwork. Personalization and interactivity because of mobile phone usage, right? It's like, what is the relevance to me and how can I share it with others? So we see the physical and the digital convergence in a flip around with that. Droga5 and agency uh, just recently did some work, really interesting, right, for Christie's auction. And this was a artwork, uh, Salvador Munde. So I don't know if you've heard, but it was uh, uh, Da Vinci's last painting, basically, discovered in, you know, through Christie's. And uh, Savior of the World is a title. So that's a familiar face, right? Um, and what they've done really is taken and flipped around and said, oh, what would it be like if the artwork could see the person and how they look and experience me, the piece of art, and if I could turn that into a social feed and broadcast the faces and the facial responses? The image isn't revealed here, besides a little sneak peek I'm giving you in the left-hand corner, and that's all you're going to get. But the point being, they're flipping the model around and saying, wow, it's about how it makes people feel. Without revealing the artwork itself, they're creating an interest uh, in terms of what the artwork could be and driving curiosity around that. Um, the other part is the co-creation of cultural experiences. It's really happening. It's interesting. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar here with the Art Institute of Chicago. No? OK. So this was a great, great, great collaboration, right? Airbnb actually recreated the physical, physical experience of the Van Gogh painting, right? So, here you have, on the right side there, you'll see an image of the actual Airbnb that you could actually rent out and stay at. Again, de deepening the experience, not just a visual now, a physical experience, immersive, deepening the relationship, and as a result, driving equity both for Airbnb, for the consumer experience, and of course for the museum or the Art Institute as, as they partnered uh, with Airbnb. Um, everyone know about the, yes, Amnesty? So this campaign here, right, so they reached out to refugees and co-created. Uh, a flag based on inspiration around the life jacket, reaching out to refugees and artists to say, hey, how do we create something that has meaning and significance? Created a flag to honor sacrifices, an anthem to lift spirits, and the whole world to support you. It went in to appear in an art installation with the MoMA and has since really functioned as a, a real tool by which to communicate a much bigger story. Again, collaborations and invitations to step way beyond your traditional boundaries to say, how do we explore opportunities to collaborate? And I say corporate America because corporate America is leaning in deeply into the bottom-up model and how they develop better relevance in storytelling. Fearless Girl, everyone know? Yeah, okay, so everyone knows this story. So Fearless Girl is another example exactly of that, right? Con, 23 awards, one of the most successful campaigns ever to change a trajectory and perspective that people have a particular category and a particular institution. Yes, they're dealing with struggles and pains. Reality is corporations as a whole are really being forced now to look deeply within their brand and their values, take a position on where they stand, and I think they can learn a lot from the arts communities. Don't ignore the opportunities and the openness that corporations and folks like ourselves working within businesses uh, have now in receptiveness to really collaborating with arts communities and driving forward on the conversation. Kickstarter, of course, platforms. Again, co-collaboration, how do you fund it? Really leaning into platforms like Kickstarter and others who facilitate that opportunity. Um, a lot I know that I went through, but wanted to highlight a couple of things around that conversation. Again, as culture shifts, more participatory than it's ever been, less assimilative, less uh, about acculturation, more about participation, uh, and openness to push the dialogue forward in lieu of what is happening in the bigger picture, right? Taking down of statues, what do you do when they go up for the Confederate statues? Uh, the fearless girl campaigns, all these elements that are raising to the forefront the visibility of arts, uh, particularly in the corporate world, uh, particularly amongst institutions and organizations in the for-profit sector that have a tremendous voice and power and sway and not neglecting the opportunity to get in front of them to have a legitimate conversation and bringing these stories to the forefront of them, say, hey, look, here's a case in point, it works. And it challenges the conversation, it's where we need to be. So dive into their world, meaning, of course, naturally the bottom up. Uh, immerse yourself, really start to understand where culture is going. Just as media is fragmenting, so too culture is. And we owe it to ourselves to lean into that conversation to understand what's happening and the possibilities. Go beyond your borders. Collaboration trumps competition. 
collaborate with partners who you may not have thought before, but open the dialogue and the conversation. We're doing a lot of think and learns with a lot of clients, right? Where one client like ABI wants to say, hey, I want to meet General Motors, so we set up a kind of a, a dialogue amongst the, the leadership there in marketing and invite other institutions in the nonprofit sector to invite, have a seat at the table. Push the dialogue forward on how we can have significant dialogue and conversation for these organizations to take a stand in the community and drive progress forward. Learn, create, measure, iterate. That's what we can learn from, I think, the lean startups, right? Get into a mindset where you don't think about the traditional process of how we used to approach things in marketing, but really get into a cyclical learn, create, and measure, which means really, again, executing quickly. In the world of social, it is about stepping out there, grabbing attention, but doing so in a way that allows you to iterate quickly, learn from that, and then continue moving forward. One of the things we often say to leave you with a closing thought is that without deviation from the norm, progress is not possible. Words of Frank Zappa. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for some questions. Not many, but two. <laughs> Does anyone have a question for Can we hear Despacito? Huh? No, <laughs> there are mics in the audience. They're right over there. Do you mind? There's a mic right behind you. Or you could tell me your question and I could just repeat it. OK, sorry. <laughs> Breaking the rules. <laughs> so I wonder if the two of you are aware of what um, what faces were missing from your presentation. Say again, please. Uh, are you aware of the faces that were missing from your presentation? From the faces that were missing from our presentation? Um, I, I don't think so. Do we? I don't think so. What do you have in mind? So you had two multi-photo slides. One of them had one woman with gray hair, the other one had none. Um, pretty much everything that we saw did not include older folks. And um, since my hair is getting grayer yeah. <laughs> by the day. Um, in the theater that I work, for example, we have a lot of older patrons. Um, we have older patrons who bring their grandkids with them. Um, to to learn and appreciate arts. Yep. Um, I think it's I think it's very problematic that this entire culture um, doesn't think about older folks. Um, in when we talk about business, they often have more discretionary funds to spend on things like arts. But also when we talk about inclusion. I mean, yeah. look here, there's, there's quite a few of us here too. So um, just, just wanted to put this out to you and remember that uh, the United States is not all um, young people. And um, let's, are, let's remember that. That's, yes, um, that's what I'm asking. I think you bring up a really good point. I think um, technically or tactically, I do believe that we had some images of uh, older people. But I think collectively in the field that we're in, you're 100% right. Uh, people, I, I think the, generally we tend to focus on what's coming up and what's next versus appreciating the current consumer base that's important and driving uh, the conversations that we're having now. So I think you bring up a fantastic point. I know us as an agency, we do have this conversation on an ongoing basis with our clients. Uh, but to be very frank, a lot of the work or a lot of the questions that when, when brands come to us, they want to know what do we do for the next you know, generation, because they feel that they're not connecting. I think the answer to that, and partially correct or incorrect, it's a, it's a dialogue, is the fact that brands feel like they have their current consumers in a really good place, and they try to figure out how to connect with those they don't have a good relationship with yet. So I, I hear your point. It, it actually gets brought up a lot, and it's, a, it's an important one. As a society, we should certainly uh, do better, but uh, we, we do engage in that conversation ongoing. Just, yeah, just one point. more sentence um, that, that these future generations are also going to grow old, of hopefully. Of course. So, yes. you know, we need to think, of of, think about the entire spectrum. Yeah, yeah, 100%. There's actually a couple of agencies that uh, have been created with this specific in mind that I know uh, of most recently because they're saying exactly what you're saying. The opportunity is here. This consumer segment is being ignored. But if I had to venture an educated guess, my perspective is the reason why the attention is not there is because um, brands feel like that they have them in, in, a, in a good place. 
to have that relationship. Yeah, and the other point, you know, along those lines, you know, so we talk about the boomer pipeline as well, right? So the transition that we saw there in terms of multi or generational marketing, it wasn't so long ago that that was a big focus for in the agency world was what we called cohorts, generational cohorts, because the boomers that were going through the pipeline were just incredible, and they still are a significant portion of driving growth and fueling growth. Case in point was, this is kind of interesting. So we talk about mindset shift, right? There was uh, an organization, I have a, a friend who worked with an agency, and this wasn't in the US, I believe it was, I wanna say it was in Portugal or Brazil. Point is, they, one of their client bases was what they identified 55 plus. They also identified uh, active adult living communities, and they actually put on a concert or an experience for them, but instead of the uh, antiquated perception of what they might enjoy, this actually featured hip hop, urban, skateboarding, and extreme sports as the experience around it. Because as they leaned into the conversations, they realized we've got to start breaking down the stereotypes and our preconceived notions because they transcend. It's not just as technology has broken borders. It hasn't just broken borders of geography and location or ethnicity and race. It also has broken down borders of ageism, so to speak, right? And our perception of what interests people have and not to, uh, again, draw those conclusions before we're fully aware. Cadillac and GM I brought up, that's a really interesting conversation for them because they have a very significant part of their customer base that is a 55 plus demo. And it is a core part of their base, right? The, the younger demos, whatever, is still a small, significant, a small uh, portion of their total revenue relative to the larger piece of the pie. So it is a conversation, a very active one, and we're trying to say, hey, we've got to stop thinking of this group, this cohort group that is a majority of your customer base in the old state ways. Your Cadillac, you're moving to a, a new place in terms of relevance in fashion and art and cool. It doesn't mean this group doesn't want to come along and experience that. So we shouldn't dismiss it and say we have to market to them differently. We have to think holistically and inclusively about inviting them to the conversation. Hi, I'm Jen. I'm from Pittsburgh, one of the least diverse places in the country. <laughs> <laughs> um, and recently we've begun to have more and more um, people moving to the city that are not originally from there and it's creating new conversations kind of old Pittsburgh new Pittsburgh and one of the things that I've witnessed I work for the Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council we're a member organization with 300 organizations is I've observed a lot of deep tension and decampment around issues of cultural appropriation. Uh, how is it that we as uh, arts presenters and as councils like uh, my own organization, how can we begin to positively address these issues? I appreciated what you said, Rod, about uh, how the arts can bring people together and that we can relate even if it's not our own personal uh, background. How can we help our audiences not decamp so quickly and enter into hostility. Yeah, I, I think the first step, and, and uh, if so, Lou will have comments um, as well. Uh, the first step into it is exactly what Bob mentioned earlier. It starts with empathy. And the empathy conversation, I think, is one that very easily is overlooked. And sometimes I think we step into trying to fix the problem without just letting people talk and listening very proactively in that sense and leaning into those conversations. The great thing that's coming out of these conversations too, and we see this, the gentrification that's happening in a lot of cities, the displacement and the tension that creates in yes. a lot of cities across America, right? So a big part of that, that it is forcing conversations around people and cities and communities to really look in and lean into their values, their perspective on what they see as being important to the future growth and the long-term growth communities for too long. And again, there's been a multitude of variables that have affected this, but we've gotten caught up in a very short term mentality of let's build, grow, progress, effectiveness, profit, all of these things, right? It is now that we do have, and this is a wonderful thing about the model shifting from top-down persuasion to bottom-up influence. As, again, we see the shift of power, so to speak, to the consumer, to the customer, to the people, those conversations are coming up and they're not, they can't be ignored anymore. They can drive agenda, they can drive change, they can drive sometimes, in some cases, like we're saying, longer rap, kind of longer discussion, but it's a healthy discussion. And I think what we owe it to ourselves to do is in that discussion, not default back to our regular tendencies of jumping in to say, hey, I've got a solution for this. I've already thought this out. In the next quarter, we're gonna do this, 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 this. It doesn't work that way anymore. This really necessitates fundamentally, I think what we miss is, how do we revisit our own organizational cultures and our processes and how we approach problem solving and rethink it? I know you guys have a class on design thinking, human-centric, all those elements. How do we structure ourselves so that when we see these dialogues and conversations coming up, we're approaching them from a very different in a fresh perspective, it starts with, with the empathy. Thank you. I think the one thing to add is that you really have to be in it for the long run, right? You can't just do something for the sake of doing something. You have to 
uh, do something, dedicate yourself to it, know it's not going to be easy through the process, and then ultimately mm -hmm. uh, come out better collectively on top at the end. Yeah, for brands that we have too, one thing I was going to note about that is it as the conversation mm -hmm. starts to shift, um, brands are being held more accountable. So more and more people are expecting companies to step in where they feel government may come in short and expecting companies to take a stand. Howard Schultz about Starbucks, right, at Ad Week at the huge conferences, he said, you know, it used to be that businesses and brands thought, well, we're going to stay, step out of these conversations. Let the arts communities, let the societies, let the communities, let the nonprofits figure it out. But now what they've come to realize is that staying on the sidelines and not getting in, not weighing in on your values and where you stand is just as dangerous for the long-term organization's growth as stepping into the conversation, actually taking a stand. So now you have to take a stand. And I think what we're seeing more and more, when I look at it from the for-profit side and brands and these conversations that are coming up, they're forcing organizations and businesses to really reevaluate and say, okay, what are our values? What do we really stand for? What do we commit to? And that is opening the door again to greater collaboration and opportunity, I think, with organizations, museums, nonprofits, et cetera, to say, okay, what have they done? How do they lean into the community? What can we learn from each other? And how can we collaborate more effectively to drive positive change? Thank you very much. Wasn't that fantastic? Can we give him whoop, one more round of applause? <clears throat> I'm Clay Lord. I'm the Vice President of Local Arts Advancement here at Americans for the Arts. And um, I just wanted to add my welcome to you and also uh, do the housekeeping. So uh, hi. Now here's the housekeeping. Um, uh, OK, so uh, if you take a look in the front of your program, you'll see you've got to schedule at a glance. Uh, and then if you dig into the program, you'll see the specific sessions and all that. We are in for a fabulous day of breakout sessions. We also have uh, some other ancillary things I just wanted to pull your attention to. I particularly wanted to point out the membership roundtables, which are happening at 11.15 and 3.15. Any of you who are not members of Americans for the Arts but are interested in learning more about uh, the work that we do with arts marketers as well as advocacy policy, arts education, public art, uh, you can have a conversation with Bridget Woodbury, who is our membership marketing coordinator at Americans for the Arts, uh, just over by the membership desk. Uh, please uh, take, uh, take that as an opportunity if you, if you have a chance. And then uh, we also at 2.35 today have a, a, an exhibitor center showcase uh, with Instant Encore, uh, which is just uh, right next to the entrance to Center Stage. So take a look at that. The great opportunities in Center Stage along with the bookstore, uh, all of our exhibitors. Please take a chance to talk with all of the exhibitors. Um, we do have a raffle associated with the exhibitors, so um, as you visit each one of them, make sure you, tap, you snap that QR code uh, so that you can uh, be part of the raffle at the end. And you can take a look in the conference app for more information about all of that stuff as well as about the sessions. So we do have the learning outcomes of the sessions in your printed program, but if you're looking for more complete descriptions or questions about the format of each session, take a look in the app and there's more information there for you. There are instructions on getting to the app in your program. Um, if you, oh, uh, at the end of the day today, we also are doing something that is a request that came from you all last year. It's called a daily recap. It's just 20 minutes. It's totally optional. If you don't want to do a daily recap, you can go get a drink. Uh, starting at 540, there are three of them in, in three breakout rooms. You'll see it in your schedule. All of them are identical. Just grab one. Um, and they're really just 20 minutes. We're going to throw a few questions out at you, and you're going to have an opportunity to discuss what you learned today uh, with some of the folks that you are hopefully getting to meet for the first time in that room, as well as some of the colleagues that you're reconnecting with here. 20-minute um, micro sessions, each led by an Americans for the Arts staff member. Try them out. Let us know what you think of them. Um, if, we, if you like them, we'll do them again. If you don't like them, we probably won't. So there you go. Um, and then after the recap, starting right at 6 o'clock, we do have a meet the members reception. Everyone is welcome to the reception. Members get drink tickets. Uh, it's, it's in the Continental Ballroom. All of the breakouts are on this same floor, except if you're going to a breakout that's in the Skyway, which, given its name, you might expect to be at the top of the building, and it is. So uh, you take the elevator all the way up to the highest you can go, and it's right there. Um, finally, uh, as you heard from Elizabeth at the beginning, we have an amazing opening reception for you tonight at an incredibly beautiful venue. Um, it's called the Claiborne Temple, and we invite you all to gather with us at the Grand Ballroom West Foyer, which is right over here. It's right next to center stage here at 6.30.
in order to participate in a special journey over with us that'll be led uh, by a marching band and a drum line. 6.30, the music will start in here. We'll be, we'll be embarking at 6.45. If you would like to, to it's, a, it's a short 10 minute walk, it's a flat walk, but if you would like to take a shuttle, we do have shuttles available as well, please still join us at 6.30 and we will have staff members there with placards to take folks who wanna go on the shuttles uh, instead down to this, the lobby area and we'll put you on the shuttle and head you over. There'll be shuttles rotating all night from seven to nine and a little bit after that too to bring you back. Um, and we hope you have a really fantastic time. One thing to note, um, the, the Claiborne Temple is still being restored and it has uneven flooring, so don't wear heels. Uh, please. Um, and with that, thank you to Elizabeth, to Jim, or, or uh, to uh, Lucy, not Jim, to Lucy, uh, to Bob, uh, Luba, and Rodrigo, and to all of you, welcome to NAMM. Have a great day. Michelle Westling, Michelle Westling, please visit the registration table. Michelle Westling, please visit the registration table. <laughs>